Hello, everyone, and welcome to Day 12, Part 2 of our series um, of 2019 Advent of Code Problems written in Rust. Um, today's video is, as I always mention at the beginning of the videos, part of a series um, where we're coding all of the 2019 Advent of Code Problems in Rust. And as you can see, it goes from day one up until uh, the last video I made was day 12, part one. Didn't quite finish day 12, so we're gonna do day 12, part two today. Um, and hopefully move on from there. I'm uh, several days behind. Uh, as you guys can see, I we're recording day 12 here. I've solved 13 and 14. I have not yet even looked at 15, 16, 17, or 18 um, because I haven't had the time, but hopefully we will get all of those videos out eventually. And as always, I also want to mention that the code uh, that we're creating on these videos is available in this repository, BC Myers AOC 2019. So uh, if you want to take a look at it later, you can go check that out there. So with that, I wanted to, I have a little agenda today. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is after I made uh, the video that I was sort of rushing to get out last time, because as I probably mentioned in the video, I was skiing yesterday, <laughs> and so I had to uh, get everything done. I ended up going to bed at one o'clock and waking up at five in the morning to drive a couple hours to upstate New York to go skiing for a day and then come back, and then I was exhausted, and now it's the next day and I'm making a new video. Um, but anyway, after I watched that video uh, from last time, I realized we can make part one, uh, the day 12 part one, uh, at least the Simni version, even faster than we made it. Then the second thing I want to do, which we, we haven't done at all, is I want to run Clippy on our code and just see um, if uh, Clippy has any suggestions for sort of better idioms we could be using or ways to clean up our code. This is something we should have been doing all along and it's always a great thing to do um, uh, when writing Rust code. For those of you who don't know, Clippy is kind of a tool that just looks over your code and um, tells you when, even though what you wrote is technically correct and will work, um, it's not the most stylistic way to write things in Rust and it gives you suggestions of how to fix it. So we'll see all the ways where I've used sort of bad style in my code. Finally, I think I left a bunch of to-dos uh, all over the place, uh, particularly on error messages like uh, that I just want to clean up. And then finally, we'll solve uh, part two of day 12, which is actually really simple to code. Um, the problem was, I thought, part two of day 12 was more of like a math logic problem than it was a coding problem. But once you know the answer, um, and apologies if, well, I, I, obviously this whole video is spoilers, but once you know the answer, it's, it's really straightforward. Um, but it takes a little bit of thinking about. Hmm. So with that, let's jump into our agenda and go to yesterday's implementation of day 12 part one to the SIMD portion. Um, so as you recall, uh, I should mention this actually, in day 12, here are the problems. Um, so there are these four moons, right? And these four moons have a position and a velocity in space. So three vectors of position and velocity. And um, each time step, they move around in a particular way. Um, the way they move around is uh, first you apply gravity. And the way gravity works in this universe is you look at the moons pairwise. So you look at each pair of moons. And uh, then you look at across each coordinate for the moon's positions. So you look at the x coordinates of the two moons and the y coordinates of the two moons separately and the z coordinates separately. Uh, you compare their positions along those various dimensions. And uh, like say if, moon, if the first moon ha is, has a greater position than the second moon, then you want to decrease the velocity of the first moon by one, and you want to increase the velocity of the second moon by one so that they end up moving closer together. So applying gravity will update their velocities. And then once you have their new velocities, then you update their positions by just taking the position uh, vector and adding the velocity vector. Um, and so in part one, we were asked to just basically say, where did the moons end up after um, a thousand steps applying this sort of update logic? And we solved that. And uh, I think we got the right answer of 7722 for my input. Um, and we, but we solved it in two ways, one just using regular code and one using SIMD code. 
Um, and so now that I'm here, I guess I'll go over what part two is. So part two um, is that uh, it, it asks you how many steps does it take for the moons to come back to a position that they have already been in. So, uh, you know, the moons have, at any given point in time, they have some position, which is a three vector, they have some velocity, which is a three vector, and then you move forward in time by taking steps. So how many steps does it take before we repeat a sort of state of the system? So where both the position vectors and the velocity vectors of all four moons are something that we've already seen before. And this is a tricky problem because the answer is a very, very large number. Um, and I think it would take too long, even in Rust and with SIMD, to just sort of simulate this and get the answer um, by brute force. Um, so we're going to have to think of a clever way to get the answer. Um, oh, wait, sorry. This is the puzzle answer. Uh, this is the example. But the, you see the puzzle answer is some huge number which we could never hope to simulate this many steps in a decent amount of time. And so we gotta figure out um, uh, a way to get this number without actually taking this many steps um, because that would take too long. So that's problem two. But jumping back to problem one, let's improve it a little bit. So here's our code from yesterday. And uh, as you can see, we, we sort of break the world up into whether or not you're compiling with SIMD turned on, or whether or not you're compiling without SIMD. Um, and one thing I wanted to notice is we spent all a whole bunch of time yesterday worrying about this line of code. So here's a, a SIMD vector, and this is a SIMD vector, and they don't implement um, partial eek uh, just by themselves. So we had to come down here and implement a partial eek function for um, our moon type which is just a wrapper around two SIMD vectors, one for position, one for velocity. And uh, so we, we did that, that's fine. We just wanna know if the position is equal to the, the position and the velocities are equal. But um, in order to do that, in order to get this, because we can't compare directly this with an, uh, this SIMD vector with another SIMD vector of the same type, we needed to pull the positions uh, out into regular numbers um, so we took our SIMD vector here and wrote it into, using this SIMD instruction, wrote it into an array of four uh, signed 64-bit uh, integers. And that's how we can sort of extract out the individual 64-bit numbers that are included in our SIMD vector. Um, and so we do that for position, for velocity, but uh, but I, I assume this takes some time to do. Um, and so we don't need to do it at all, is one thing I realized. So we know we've written our code such that it only works with four moons, and we ensure that in the parse input. So we can just say here for i in, let's see, 0 to 4, and for j in 0 to 4, um, if i equals j, then continue, and that avoids ever having to compare two SIMD vectors. Um, but so now we just need to get out moon i, um, which is going to be the moons, uh, so self.0, because our moons type holds an array of um, moons, dot get i, and we know it's going to be there, so unwrap and say let moon j equals self dot zero dot get j dot unwrap. Um, and that's one s small change that avoids us having to do an equality check on moons. Now we're just doing an equality check on these, uh, these counter variables. Um, but the second thing I realized is that, you know, we don't need to go through this loop twice. Or we don't need to compare each pair of moons twice, which is what we're doing here, right? So. Uh, you know, one, one time going through this loop, we'll get numbers say like one and two, and another time we'll get numbers two and one. And so it, we're looking at, I hope that's clear that with this, we're looking at each pair of moons twice, right? Um, but we don't really need to do that. We should just go through once. And uh, and in, in this version where we go through them both twice, we're just updating sort of what I'm calling moon i um, by 
uh, updating the velocity appropriately. But why don't we just go through this once and it will both update moon i and moon j um, in the same, in one iteration. Because now we're, we're going to set it up so we only do it once. And so in doing that, we just have to get a reference to moon j and get a reference to its velocity um, vector and then come down here and subtract the operand that we built up that we added to moon i but r recall like if moon i is greater than moon j then we want to uh, subtract from moon i and add to moon j and so we want to do the opposite to moon j whatever we do to moon i and so we can do this and this avoids us having to calculate this operand twice for no reason right like we have the right operand um, uh, in the old code, right, we were doing all of this twice um, redundantly, and we don't need to do that. So in the new code, right, like, let's do this, and instead of having two nested for loops, let's just loop over all the combinations of moons, but making sure that we only visit a pair once. Um, and so uh, the way I want to do that is because we, we've hard-coded our code to only work with four moons, right, so we can say four... Um, I comma J in uh, and then we just we can just enumerate all of the possibilities here because there's only six of them so dot uh, into iter and here we, we know we're gonna have to compare it zero with one we're gonna have to compare zero with two we're gonna have to compare zero with three we're gonna have to compare one with two we're gonna have to compare one with three and we're going to have to compare two with three. And this exhausts all of the possible pairs when we don't care about order, right? This is the combination of four items taken two at a time where order doesn't matter. So we don't need this check anymore. We're ensured that that's never going to happen. And uh, these, I think, just need our references now, so they need to be that. And so this code now should do the same thing, except for avoiding looking at each pair twice. We're just doing it once, which avoids doing this all again. And we also are no longer having to compare moons for equality. And so this should be a tiny little speed up to our last code. But since we're writing SIMD, I guess the point is to make do everything as, as efficiently as possible. So I hope this, get, this gets us like in a little better place. So let's run cargo uh, test on both the regular code and the SIMD code and see if we are still passing. So the uh, we didn't change any of the regular code, so obviously that run ran fine. Um, but the second run here was with SIMD and that seems to have worked. Um, and just for fun, let's do cargo bench. Um, uh, let's run cargo bench for both um, to see if this did indeed improve things. So day 12. This might take a little bit of time, but. So I think that's all I wanted to do here. Um, I mean, we could do the same thing in our regular code, actually. Let's go to the non simd version of the step function, which is here. Um, I mean, we could, do, we could be doing the same thing with pairs that we did and to make it comparable, I guess that's fine. So for i, j in, let's see, an array of 0, 1. While well, that's running down there, I'll do this. 0, 2, 0, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3. And we have to compare uh, 2, 2, 3, right? Dot into iter. So we no longer need that, we no longer need that, we no longer need that, we no longer need that. Oh, I'm missing a curly. Um, so we get position i, position j. If that's less than here, we need to take moon j, borrow mute, and subtract one from the velocity. And here we need to add one to the velocity. 
and that should make the other code sort of equivalent. But as you can see, this gave us a massive speed up in the SIMD version because we're avoiding doing redundant work. And now the um, well, let's let's run it again to to make because I I wanted to make the same change in the regular code, but um, as you can see, our SIMD version is now way faster than the old normal version. Uh, but let's run it again because we just now improved the normal version. Uh oh. What, oh yeah, so we have to pull out like we did. We have to pull out moon i this way. So moon i is self dot zero dot get star i dot unwrap because we know it's going to be there, and moon j is self dot zero dot get j because we know it's going to be there. And I guess we we should run the test first and just make sure I didn't make a stupid mistake. Is this still giving us the same answer? It is. And now let's run the benchmarks again. And this should really be a constant now, I guess. So const pairs equals this is an array of tuples of, I guess, U sizes, um, and that is six long, and that is uh, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3. I mean, once we decided to sort of not write, write code that only works for four moons, uh, we um, we can get speed ups by like hard coding this information instead of making it dynamic. So now that we have the pairs, this pairs uh, constant, let's just use that here. And let's use it in the SIMD code as well. But as you can see, as I now turn my attention over to the right and our benchmarks, uh, we did get a big improvement uh, with that little change to um, to our normal code. But the SIMD code is still running uh, way faster than the normal code, um, and so that's like a nice little change, I think. To um, that's a nice little change to. Uh, yesterday's code that that improves it a tiny, tiny bit. So let me go back to my to do's. Okay, so we covered the first thing I want to talk about. Now I want to run Clippy. And this is more of a on our overall project, we're going to run Clippy and uh, see if we can't make our code a little bit more idiomatic. So cargo Clippy. Um, so Clippy is kind of a, a linter, uh, as I explained, that like just tells you where you're using non-idiomatic code and gives you warnings. Uh, and so we should have a bunch of warnings. I ran this before, and we do. And I have yet to fix them, because I want to fix them live for you, obviously. Let's wait for Clippy to compile itself and get done. And indeed, we have a bunch of warnings. So let's go to the top and just knock them off one by one. Um, okay, so here's an example of a Clippy warning. So in our computer file, right, where we have this code return some yada yada yada, but we don't need to do that. We, it, we in Rust, it's sort of considered not very idiomatic to use return when you don't have to because. Um, the end of an expression, if you leave off the semicolon, um, or the end of a, I'm going to get expression and statement mixed up, but basically in Rust, right, so what line is this? 289 GG. Um, so here, you know, whatever, whatever this expression evaluates to is going to be the return value of this function. So instead of saying return here, we can just say in this branch, right, of the match statement, we just this whole thing will evaluate to that, and then the, it will return it there. So we don't need, uh, we didn't need to have that return there. And Clippy shows us that we're using unidiomatic code. Um, so in day two, there's another little error. 
or not error, but warning. So in day two, it's telling us that it would be nicer for the readers of this code to see that this is 19,690,000 just like that. Um, so to add these little underscores, you can just make your code a little bit more readable. Clippy warns us about that. Let's see, day three, we can collapse two if statements. So in day three, line 188, uh, indeed we can. I could say if that contains that and this, and then I can get rid of this if statement, I think. Oops. And that. And now you don't need that. There you go. And I believe it's going to give me the same error down here. So this can just be one if statement. Like that. So that's probably going to take care of these two warnings. Uh, let's see. Now, the next one. Oh, yes. Clippy warns you. Whenever you call split... Oops. Uh, whenever you call split, and you need to give it a pattern. Well, a pattern can be many different things. One of the things it can be is a string. The other thing it can be is a character. But when your pattern is only one character long, they encourage... Clippy encourages you to actually use a car in split. So let's go back to computer and go to line... Uh, Oh, why did Clippy warn it? Why could we not do that? Well, we're gonna get an error on this because I messed up the uh, I messed this up somehow. But let's let's look at that later. Let's go to line twenty one, and here we can use a character instead of a string. Um, in computer line one thirty three. Oops. Oh gosh. All right, let's run. Let's just run Clippy over again. But 133. This can just be ROM as ref to vec. We don't need all of that verboseness. I think we have we have this error we are gonna have to deal with. Yeah. So 291 GG. Let's just return this back to what it was and I'll try and see why I got this wrong earlier later. Alright, let's run Clippy again. Alright. So go back to the top. We fixed some errors, so we should have gotten rid of some of them. Uh, this is the one that we did not get rid of. I actually want to do this return right away because why would we do this unnecessary calculation? I mean, I think this is an example where Clippy is sort of being wrong about things. Um, so let's just come down here and shut Clippy up. And the way you shut Clippy up is you say um, allow Clippy uh, needless return. And so now uh, we've told Clippy explicitly that we don't want it to lint that the way it did. And so this this should be gone. And it's not at all gone. Why is it not at all gone? 289. Oh, because it was here. It wasn't that one. It was this one, obviously. So I was looking at the long, wrong line. That's why. So this doesn't need to be a return, right? Because if we just have this entire expression evaluate to that, it will be returned, and so we're good. So we fixed that problem, sorry. All right, so now that we fixed that problem, let's just keep going through Clippy errors. So here's another time we're using split with a string when it could be with a character, and that's in day three. Um, line 73. Um, so this, we can use just a plain character instead of a string slice. Uh, day three also has, now this is a Clippy, uh, as you can see, this is a Clippy error. 
Clippy will deny things for you as well as give you warnings. Um, but this happens to be good. Um, so what it's telling us, I think, is we have this add, um, we're implementing add, but in that we're using a subtraction somehow. Um, and Clippy's like, well, that's odd. Usually you don't subtract things in an add implementation, but in this case we actually do want to um, subtract things in an, uh, in an add implementation. So this is where we are going to override C Clippy and we're gonna say allow Clippy uh, suspicious arithmetic impl and hopefully that will go away. Let's see if we if that got rid of it. And indeed, no, it did not. It's because I probably misspelled everything. So Clippy suspicious arithmetic impl. Did I spell it right there? I did. So we got rid of that warning because we know that this is actually right. We do want some minuses in our add implementation. So the next error is day four, line 82. Um, here, familiar error, right? This can be a character. Um, familiar error in day six, uh, line 146. This can be a single character. Um, a new type of error on line 160. So, or insert width takes a closure, right? Um, that takes no arguments and it needs to return a vector. Well, instead of having the closure just call vec new, I mean, this, this is a function, right? Um, so without the parentheses, we're not calling it, but this is like, the new static method on a vector is something that implements, uh, I guess, or insert with needs one of the function traits, so either fn or fn mute or fn once, and th that that this is that, and so let's just use that as opposed to this closure syntax, which is more verbose. So again, Clippy sort of helps you write more idiomatic code. Our code was correct; it's just this is more idiomatic in Rust. So we do that, and we should have gotten rid of those errors uh, or warnings. So here's an example where we could be using n minus equals one instead of n equals n minus one. So let's fix that in day seven, uh, line 21. Doo, doo, doo. So this can be minus equals one, right? Next error. Uh, day seven, we're using a loop syntax when we could use while let syntax, which is a little bit more idiomatic. So uh, oh, we're in day seven. What line are we going to? 50? Here we go. So this should be able to be uh, while let okay data equals rx dot input dot receive then we want to do all these things Oops. but we were pattern matching on data so we want this to be part phase setting input output and now we don't need this stuff. And this needs to go inside the loop. This needs to go outside the loop. There we go. So that should have fixed that. Instead of using loop syntax, use while let if you can. Um, in day seven, are we in day seven? We're still in day seven on line 96. Apparently here, uh, we can just use a regular for loop and indeed we can. So we could say 
uh, for part output in rx output dot iter do all of these things right um, so for loop I guess while loops better than for loop or better than loops and for loops better than while loops according to Clippy in terms of what it counts as idiomatic um, all right so day eight we are on line 16 this can be times equals right uh, no uh, minus equals sorry this can be minus equals 48 um, here oh this is a really interesting one and when I came across this I, I've never heard of the byte count crate um, but Clippy is suggesting, so it, here, let's see what it's saying here. You appear to be counting bytes in a naive way. So we want the number of zeros here. We had a layer and we wanted to iterate over it and find out the number of bytes in this layer which are equal to zero, right? Um, so this is a way to do it and perfectly fine. But Clippy says uh, there's this byte count crate that could do it better. So let's look at byte count. Um, this is a cool crate that I didn't know about. Clippy, um, Clippy told me about it. Um, so let's look at byte count, and we'll pull it in. So, oops, let's copy this and add it to our cargo.toml and just minor version number should be fine. And we'll go back to what was this day eight and we're looking at line 16 uh, no we're looking at line 22 there we go so Clippy suggests instead of doing this we use um, where was it uh, byte count must have a function called count and we give it the layer and we say we're looking for the number of zeros um, and that's the same thing here for ones and twos. So the number of ones and the number of twos in a layer are just byte count layer one and byte count layer two. Oh, and I'm gonna have to quit so it recognizes that we pulled in a new crate. Um, so there we go, that should work. And let's see what the byte count crate does, because it's kind of cool how it works. Um, so let me go to documentation. And Clippy suggested we use this count function, which counts the occurrences of a byte in a slice fast. Okay, so how does it do it fast? Well, let's look at the source code. Um, and how it does it fast is it uses SIMD. Um, so if um, we have this feature and we're on this target architecture and we have AVX2, right? It's gonna use SIMD to do this count as opposed to use like a more generic function that doesn't work with SIMD. And so there, because a library has implemented SIMD behind our backs, we sort of get it for free, right? And that error should go away. But I thought that was a really neat lint uh, because it just made like a tiny piece of our code faster because uh, there's a better way to do this, and we didn't have to write it ourselves. We just pull in a crate. Mm. So I guess Clippy has to completely rebuild because we pulled in a new crate. That's unfortunate. But let's wait for that. All right. So we still have some more Clippy errors. Day 10, uh, this is the same problem we had with vec new earlier. Like we could just pass it a point of like the hash at new without the parentheses. So let's do that. So day 10, line 63, uh, where am I? There I am. So this can just be, don't pass a closure, just pass the function itself. Um, 
oh, we could use uh, this syntax. I have a character and I say as you ate. Well, there's a terser way to write that by just using a byte literal. If you append b, or you prepend b to a character literal, it, it interprets it not as a character, but as a byte, which is what we want. So uh, let's go to day 11. And this was line 109. Um, and this can just be a byte literal as opposed to a character cast into an, uh, a byte. Um, same thing here, so day 11, 118. Oops, not 188, 118, GG. Um, this can be a byte literal, which means this probably also can be a byte literal. And we should get rid of those warnings. Let's run Clippy again. Oh, we don't have that much more to go. So in day 11, uh, are we in day 11? We're in day 11, 159, GG. Um, this, this is a trivial, so we have a copy type, right? Um, but this method is taking a, um, a reference to a copy type, but why would we ever do that? Let's just pass the type because it's copy. Um, so let's see if that got rid of that and didn't create any other errors. It didn't. Um, all right. So, in day 12, this is code we just wrote, because I did it poorly, <laughs> um, 199gg. Apparently, if you have an array literal, um, calling into iter does the same thing as just calling iter. So let's call iter instead. Um, and that should be the same in our SIMD code, which the Clippy is not running on our SIMD code right now, um, because... Or no, it's only running on our SIMD code because I have I have that set. Uh, I'm compiling for native architecture automatically, but um, this code was not running with Clippy, but we know we want to change that too. And then Clippy tells us, what is the last stuff? All right. Uh, I think this is a warning. Let's go to 268GG. I think this is a warning that we're just gonna keep. Uh, we're just gonna ignore. So it's saying here that, so these types, uh, these type, these SIMD vectors have to have a specific alignment. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, I'll give you a brief sort of overview of alignment. So you can think of memory as being like, you know, your memory is a big array of just stuff, right? This is what your computer's memory like really is, <laughs> um, kind of. Um, and some types need to be aligned to certain multiples of bytes. So let's say, let's say that I mean I don't know what this type needs to be aligned to, but sometimes you need to align. Uh, this type needs to start at like say a multiple of four. So it could start at the zeroth position. It could start at the fourth position. It could start at the eighth position, but it couldn't start, say, here for reasons. <laughs> um, and so it needs to make sure that it's it's a type that needs to be aligned, right? And what it's yelling at us at is like, uh, this needs a mutable sort of raw pointer to this type right here is a M256i, right? Um, so this function needs to take a raw pointer to an M256i. And that's why there's two as meet here. So let me explain this a little better. I didn't explain it well last time. So here we create an uninitialized array, right? Uh, it's a, a, of length four and it contains uh, I64s, right? Then here we get a mutable reference to that array and we cast it to a raw pointer. So this right here, just this is a raw pointer to an array of this type. But I happen to know that the memory representation of this, right, is the same as this. And so then I take the raw pointer uh, to an array and I cast it as a raw pointer to this type. And that's what this function needs, right? But what Clippy is worried about is 
you can't write something into uh, this might not be aligned correctly right um, but I think we're okay here because there's two versions of this function um, so there's there's this store blah 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 and then there's this store you blah 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 and what the you means is unaligned so it's a little bit slower but it means that this function will work even if the pointer you're trying to write into is not aligned correctly um, and so I think we're good with any alignment issues we could have here and so I'm going to ignore this warning um, and just say uh, allow Clippy um, cast pointer alignment um, and we're going to do the same thing down here and see if that gets rid of our errors but before we move on to this, I realized that um, this sort of taking taking a SIMD taking a SIMD vector and getting out our vec three type that should be something we can do in general with all um, uh, that's something we can do in general. So let's take this code and sort of abstract it into our utilities uh, crate. So in utilities, we have this vec three type, right? And really, what we should be able to do is say impl uh, i64, or, sorry, impl from, yeah, from, if we have an mm, an m256i, the simd thing, we should be able to make a vec3 of i64s. Um, and the way we do that is just this code that we've already written. So this is our simd vector, it's a type m. 256i and it returns self and if we just stick all of that code here now we have it in sort of a generic way but um, we need this code to only compile when we're using simd and so we have to do we have to do all of this mess up here where we say if we're compiling with simd right um, If we're compiling with SIMD, then we want to be able to do this, but otherwise we don't. And we need to pull in this type, right? Um, and so this type needs to be available, and the way we do that is, uh, let's see, in our SIMD, in our SIMD module here, this is how we're pulling in the types. The SIMD types, let's do that here. In fact, this is a from implementation, so let's put it in its own module, module SIMD. And uh, we'll only compile this entire module if this is the case. And so now this impl block, uh, this impl block and all of these imports can come in here. And that's sort of clean, right? Um, and we need to use super star. And we need, uh, we need, uh, let's move these down. I like the conditional compilation stuff after everything else. And I like the standard library stuff first, then third party, then our own. Um, oh, and this is not self.pause anymore, this is just v, right? Um, and so now we have, we have a generic way um, to get a vec3 from a simd vector, and so in our code in day 12, right, we don't have to repeat ourselves because self dot pause becomes just self dot pause dot into and self dot uh, vel becomes self dot vel dot into and we have eliminated some code duplication so let's run cargo clippy everything still seems to work it's yelling us for one more thing which is you are implementing hash explicitly, but have derived partial eek. Um, and we're doing that for F64. 
and this gets back to hopefully hopefully what I've done our, our wrapper f64 type hopefully it's correct and this is not a big deal um, but it, it's yelling at us because remember the invariant of hash this is an invariant of hash if X equals Y then hash of X must equal hash of Y um, and it's worried that we're messing up this invariant because we're deriving partial eek, um, but we're implementing hash in a sort of different way. Um, but I think this is correct because we, we can't get not a number. Uh, we can't create an F64 if from not a number, right? Um, and partial eek I mean, if you didn't have not a number, I think floating points would be able to implement eek, and so I, th I think all of this is correct. But if if if, the, if none of this is if if I, there's a problem with this f64 type that I implemented here, I'll think about this later. Uh, maybe you guys can comment, and I will dig into it and fix it and really look at why it's yelling at us here. Um, but for the moment, we're just going to say. Um, uh, we're, we're gonna keep this a warning, not a denial. Just so, let's say warn clippy derive hash xor eek. And so now clippy should give us a warning instead of a, yeah, it give us a warning and I'll leave this in uh, the code just so if it's wrong for whatever reason, somebody can comment and we can come back and fix it. But for right now, it's it's working for us. Um, so let's do let's run cargo clippy um, on both sides of the code, the normal compilation mode and the um, the other code. And indeed, it looks like in both our normal and our simd code, we've eliminated all of the warnings and errors from clippy except for this one which I've explicitly said, let's keep as a, actually, let's do this. Let's do allow and just put a to do, verify that this is kosher, right? So now if we run Clippy, we should get no errors and we've completely eliminated, we've made our code more idiomatic across the entire library. So that is, uh, that is Clippy all done and dusted. Um, and I wanted to show you that tool and sort of say we should have been doing this all along. Like every time, uh, in fact, you can set up in your CI ways to sort of have your your builds fail um, if Clippy doesn't pass, and that's generally a good practice for libraries because Clippy is um, Clippy is a really good tool, and it makes your code more idiomatic and more like how uh, you know more readable and more like what everybody else in the community is doing. Um, all right, so the last thing I wanted to do before we jump in is we have a couple to-dos in different places in our library, and we should just get rid of those. So the one I just wrote, I want to keep, obviously, but in day 12, we have a to-do here, um, but that's correct, right, because we, uh, we haven't done part two, but we also have this thing to write. So I remember I said, whenever you use unsafe code, and I'm not going to do this for when we're using SIMD, but here when we're allocating uninitialized vectors, I do think we should write a comment about it. So uh, safety. Um, uh, this is safe because the code below ensures that by the time we would ever try to touch the moon's array, all values inside will have been, uh, will contain uh, specific values that we have written to it. That's a terrible, terrible message, but we're just going to leave it. <laughs> just to show you guys, I mean, this is horribly worded, but 
Um, just to tell you guys that I do think it's important whenever you're using unsafe code to write a comment about it. And uh, the same goes for, uh, I think we're using an uninitialized array. This is something I did not, I should have put a to-do on, but here, down here in our VEC3 comment, we're using an uninitialized array to uh, convert a SIMD vector into um, safe because the code below ensures that because the call to mm256 store u si256 will write uh, values to the uninitialized array, right? So we won't be trying to access junk memory. All right. Um, where else do we have to-dos? So we have to-dos in day 12 again that were related to errors. To-do. Um, so if we cannot find, so this is a failed to parse input, failed to parse line, line, sure. Uh, line into a moon, right? And this should be um, found, this should be found blank coordinates, but need four, right? Or three, J. Let's see. So we want to keep this one. This is what we're going to build out today for part two of day 12. So in day 10, I must have had a to do. So day 10, uh, in part one, if we do not find a point, so what we were doing, what we were doing here, uh, so let directions, map entry, what was day 10 even about? Oh, is the problem with the asteroids? And uh, I have to go back and read. I don't have the context for what day ten was about. Day ten. Find new asteroid belt, monitoring station. Oh yeah, this was the directions thing. And so what was part two asking us? What's the 200th asteroid gonna be? Um, oh no, this is part one. Part one was how many other asteroids can be detected Oh, th this is just, this would occur if um, our parse input function, no, this would occur if points is zero, right? So really what we want to do is say, um, if points is empty, bail uh, must provide non-empty slice of points or something like that right and so then we can unwrap this here because we will definitely have found a point unless oh uh, now let's just say like 
let's just say, could not find no point. <laughs> no asteroid is able to see other asteroids, <laughs> which is an error, right? That would be bad. Something would be messed up with our input. Um, so that's, I mean, these are all bad to-do messages. I'm just saying, look, if you have a real library, like write real error messages and do all this kind of stuff, um, I'm not focusing on writing good error messages. I'm just focusing on saying, hey, like, if you leave to-dos in your code, like, go back and look at them at some point. Um, so day eight, we have a couple to-dos. So in part one, if... I don't remember what this is about. Uh, what's day eight? Oh, this was the image question. So if we have our buffer chunks. I don't know, the error. <laughs> I don't want to go back and figure out what this was. Uh, so day eight, 55. Um, and here we're just constructing the, we're reconstructing the image. So if we ever found zero, a, a non-zero one, there's like bad input found. Uh, found digit that is neither one nor or neither zero nor one or something like that and this is uh, bad input must contain I think this is what this is blank rows and blank columns. Or something like that. Um, the point is not to get these error messages completely right, because I don't really care. The point is to just show you guys that like, occasionally, if you leave to-dos in your code, you should go back and fix them and do it better than I'm doing. Um, so that is what I want to do to fix some of the to-dos. And now we can actually start implementing day, day, day 12 part two. So let's remember day 12. Uh, so day 12, we have these moons. They have positions in space and velocity in space. And uh, the first question was, if you take a, a thousand time steps, like essentially where do they end up? But the second question is much more interesting. It says, hey, like, when will these, mo these four moons ever repeat a state? where state is um, the position vector and the velocity vector of each moon all being what they used to be. And the it's not good enough to just use brute force to um, like move time forward um, and just figure out like when have I seen this last um, sort of total state of the system because the answer is way too big of a number. So how do we do this? Well, the insight, the mathematical insight to this problem is to realize that when moons update, right, um, they, whatever happens in the x direction is completely independent of whatever happens in the y direction, which is completely independent of whatever happens in the uh, z direction. And so really what we want to figure out is how many steps does it take for us to repeat an x position? And how many steps does it take for us to repeat a y position? And how many steps does it take for us to repeat a z position? Which will be three completely independent numbers. But we know, right, that if you think about it for a second, um, the least common multiple of those three numbers will be how long it takes for the entire system across all the coordinates to repeat. Um, so what we need to do here 
is we've got our moons, right? And we need to start a loop. And on each loop, we're going to step forward like one. Oops. And so now we're just running in an infinite loop. Um, and we don't have an answer yet. Well, look, we'll, we'll get answer one out for a second. Actually, well, answer one is easy, right? So we'll have a counter for how many times we did the loop. Let mute um, count equals zero, right? And we'll sort of increment the count every time we come in. So count plus equals one. And then if count equals a thousand, right? Then this is answer one. Um, but we don't want to break the loop because we're gonna have to continue searching. So let's say let mute answer one equals none. And after, if the count is a thousand, we can say answer one is sum of this. Um, and then we'll say let answer one equals, um, well, we can we can do it this way. We can say answer one question mark, and we'll initialize answer one to an error. So error, error, um, did not complete a thousand steps. Um, and this just needs to be okay. So now this code will work, but it'll be an infinite loop, right? So if we try and run cargo run day 12 with data 12, it'll never finish, right? Oh. And I just realized I'm out of coffee, so I'm going to take a break and get some coffee, and I'll be right back. All right, I've got my coffee, and I'm back. Uh, so anyway, that all compiled, but it does indeed loop forever, uh, as we suspected, because there's no way for this to break. But what we want to do, right, is we want to keep a hash map um, that is just going to be uh, uh, what do we want to do? I'm going to keep three hash maps, um, I think, which means we need, we're probably going to need hash map. Yeah, use standard collections hash map. And we want, let's do it this way, maps equals hash map new. We want three of them because we're going to want a separate one for each. Uh, coordinate um, and so we take a step well before we even take a step we want to say we want to record the positions in the hash in the hash map hash set Right? Yeah, we just need hash sets for each of these. Um, okay. Uh, so we want to keep track of what positions we've seen, right? So you could call this scene. Um, so we need. Um, we need to know what the x position and the x velocity is and keep track of that in the first of these hash maps and we similarly need to do it for the others so really what I want is I want something like a state which is going to be a vec2 of which is going to be a vec2 of it's going to be different in SIMD code versus regular code I think 
So let me go down here and explain what I mean. So the moons is going to have a Oh, we can just keep track of the moon's x position. Uh, so really we want we want a function on moons called state. And that's going to return to us let's just say an array of states that are three long and so the state type is going to be type state is going to be a vec2 of in this case vec a tuple of no a vec2 of well it doesn't really have to be a vec2 we can just return a tuple of vec3 i64s and vec3 i64s right so let mute array equals state or uh, equals uh, vec3 default vec3 default just to initialize it with something and then um, we want to put in this well really we can just return straight away an array so we can do this literally um, the state we want to return is self dot uh, pause no Oh, we need it for all of them. Uh, why am I being confused? Hmm. I want to drink coffee and not think about this, so I'm going to put the video on pause and write it, and then I will come back and explain it. Hold on. All right, I'm back and I did all the complicated logic off camera and now I'll just walk you guys through it because it was too much for me to reason about multiple days after I actually implemented it live. Um, so I'm cheating again, but um, so here we go. Um, this program now is sort of, I think roughly where we left off except for I renamed count to the number of steps. So this is our, major, our main run function. First, we're gonna get out the moons from the input we're going to set the number of steps we've taken to zero. And then we're going to go into a loop. And every loop, we're going to increment the number of steps. Well, we're going to take a step. I guess it's clear this way. We're going to take a step. And then we're going to increment the number of steps. And if ever we get to 1,000 steps, right, we can get the answer out to number one, which is just the energy of the moons, uh, the energy of the moons. And so now we have um, part one all sort of working. So for part two, what we're going to need to do is I want to know just in the x direction, how many times does it take to repeat itself? Just in the y direction, how many times does it take to repeat itself? And just in the z direction. Because these are sort of completely independent values, right? Um, we're going to figure out the, these three values and then the least common multiple of those is going to be the answer to the question. Hopefully that's clear. So how do we get that? Well. We're going to keep track of what we've seen in each direction. So um, this is going to be like a state of the system in the x direction. Um, well, a hash set of all the states that we've seen just for the x direction. This is going to be for the y direction, and this is going to be for the z direction. We're also going to keep track of the number of uh, steps it takes for us to repeat which uh, in each direction, which is just a simple array um, that's initialized to none because we haven't found any repeats yet. Um, and then we're going to do the following. But before I get to this code, I want to show you uh, how we're calculating the state of the system in a particular direction. So um, I guess let's go down to the moon code for just regular um, without SIMD. 
So on a moon, uh, we're going to be able to say what's our state in each direction, right? So we're going to produce an array of position and velocity um, in each direction, right? So this is the position, the first element in this array is the position, the x direction, the velocity in the x direction. The second element is the position in the y direction, the velocity in the y direction. So you can see that here. We just sort of build it. Um, so the position and velocity in the x direction is here. In the y direction, it's here. In the z direction, it's here. And that's the state this particular moon is in, right? Represented by an array. Um, so we can easily see it in the uh, per coordinate. So down here, so we did that. This is for the normal code under moons. It's going to be slightly different for the SIMD code. So if we come down to the SIMD code, we're going to have a similar function step with the exact same signature. Um, and it's going to output the exact same thing, except for before we can get um, this array in SIMD, right, we have to pull out the, um, the positions as rvec3. So remember, we have a SIMD vector here, which we can turn into rvec3. So we get the positions. Um, across each dimension, the velocity across each dimension. And then we break that up. We're sort of just transforming this so that we get an array back of position and velocity in x direction, position and velocity in y, position and velocity in z. So each moon can tell us what state it's in across its different directions. And then for the system as a whole, right, the moon system, so now this code can be agnostic to normal or Cindy. Then we have this function, right? Uh, which tells us what is the state of the entire system of moons. And we want it to return. Um, we want to know this by coordinate. So we want to know what is the position all four like moons are in in their x direction um, and their y direction and their z direction. So hopefully you guys can see why we're... Uh, this gives us like an array of the states of the system where we're accounting for all four moons, right? Um, and so the way I've done this code is I just initialize and uh, get an uninitialized array and loop over the coordinates and loop over the moons. And the state of each individual moon, right, is going to be, well, we dip into our array of moons and we pull out the right moon we want, which is a ref cell, so we borrow it, and then we call state on it. So this is the state of in the first iteration of this loop, right, this is the um, the state of, actually, this can be reversed. We don't need to do these things twice. This can come up here, because it does not depend on the coordinate. So for each moon, we get out its state. And then for each coordinate, right, um, the state is an array. Um, so we can pull out, like, say, the x coordinate of the state. And we can stuff it in like this larger array we're building, which first we index by the coordinate and then we index by the moon. And so once we're done with this, we will have gotten we will have gotten out the state of the entire system. So hopefully that's clear. Um, so if we come out here, now we're ready in our regular code. In our loop, before we do anything, we want to know what's the state of the system, right? And then for each coordinate, we want to add the state to our to the hash map of states. So, um, but we only want to do this if we haven't already gotten the answer for when it repeats. So, if we have not seen the state in the coordinate we're looking at then we want to insert it into our hash set, right? Um, sorry, if we've, well, regardless, we want to insert it in our hash set. And insert on a hash set returns a Boolean that said that is true if it, the item you're trying to insert was not in the hash set before, and it's false if the item was already there. Um, and so if the item was already there, that's what this if check does. It says if the item was already there when we try and insert it, well, then we know that we found something that repeats, right? So we can take our counts for that particular coordinate and we can say, well, it repeated in these number of steps, right? And then all we need to do is we need to check down here if we're done, if we found the number of steps it takes to repeat for every single coordinate, right? 
we just take the counts and iter over it, and if all of those are sum, meaning we've set them all here, then we're done and we break. Um, and so that's a little bit complicated, but it will show you, I'll show you what counts is down here when we run it. Uh, let's run, let's run it for, yeah, let's run it for both. So let's run cargo release day 12 with data 12. And what this is telling us is the x coordinate states will repeat every 268,296 steps. The y coordinate will take this many steps to repeat, and the z coordinate will take this many steps to repeat. And so now to get the answer, hopefully it's clear because these are completely independent, we just need to find the least common multiple of these three values, and we will have the answer. And so to do that, we need a least common multiple function. So in our utilities function, let's build that out or in our utilities module, let's build that out. So um, these values are, what type of values are these? I, for, I forget if they're, they're probably I64s. So um, what type is counts? Counts dot, da da da. See what type counts is. Counts is an option of just generic integers. Um, so, well, they're always going to be positive. And in steps, they're always going to be positive. So let's implement least common multiple on, say, like a, a, a U64. So uh, let's make a function least common multiple of A, which is a U64, and B, which is a U64 and that returns their least common multiple. Um, but to do that, first we need, well, I'll tell you what this is. This is just gonna be A times B divided by the greatest common factor of A and B. That's how least common multiples work. So we need to figure out what is the greatest common factor between A and B, and that's gonna output a U64. And um, the way to do this, there's, there's something called Euclid's algorithm, which will give you the greatest common factor. And I believe, let me see if I can explain this a little bit. Um, so you have the larger of the two numbers. If you take the larger of the two numbers and you divide it by the smaller, and then you get out a remainder, Um, let's just implement this. We need to know which one is bigger and which one is smaller. So uh, I think we do, let's see, if A is greater than B, then A is larger, or let's say let's smaller larger equals this. So here, the smaller is B and the larger is A. Otherwise, the larger is A and the smaller is B. So we know which one is smaller and larger. And the way this algorithm works is you say, uh, the remainder is larger divide, or mod smaller. Um, and you do a loop where, um, this is a little bit of black magic, but this is just a Euclid's algorithm. If you wanna know what it is, uh, more about it, Google it. Um, so the, larger becomes the smaller, and the smaller becomes the remainder. Um, and then you do this again. Mute. And the way you find the greatest common multiple is if ever the remainder equals zero, then 
the answer is the previous remainder, which in this case would be the smaller, I believe. Let's get rid of warnings for a second. Okay, I think that'll work. Um, let's write a test for it um, because I'm not entirely sure. Um, all right, so down here, let's say pub create function test greatest common factor, greatest common factor. And we'll just say, uh, I think these need to be these need to be non-zero, right? So if a equals zero or b equals zero, yeah, this won't work if either one of them is zero. So bail um, uh, greatest common factor function only works with positive inputs. So this needs to return a result of this and an error. And we'll come down here and we'll turn okay, we'll return okay smaller. Which means this now needs to return a result of this and an error. And we'll return, we'll question mark that, and we'll return OK of the entire expression. So now that should be working. Um, so we come back down to our tests. And we need to test greatest common factor function. So we're going to need use super star. And the greatest greatest common factor of let's say 5 and 10 should be 5 right so assert equals 5 greatest common factor of that and let's just see if I got that basic one right oh this needs to be a test so cargo test test greatest common factor no capture and see what we get. And we can add some more test cases here. So let's say randomly, I don't know, 15 and, or sorry, uh, 15 and what, 21. This is seven times three, this is five times three. So the greatest common factor here should be three. Um, let's test, let's assert that GCF 1, 0 is error. Um, let's see, running tests. Uh-oh, we're not breaking our loop. So there's something wrong with my implementation here. This needs to be, uh, the remainder needs to be updated. The remainder equals, uh, we need to do this. Um, let remainder, remainder equals that. Uh, if remainder is zero, then return smaller. Otherwise, reset larger to smaller and remainder smaller and calculate it again. So let's see if this works. And it passed. Good. I think this is the right answer. But what I want to check is if it gets, if it starts out where the remainder is going to be zero, does it give us the right answer? And I'm not sure it will. No, it did. It did. So 
here's a quick and dirty, I'm, I'm sure there's a prettier way to write this, but here's a quick and dirty implementation of Euclid's algorithm to calculate the um, calculate the greatest common factor between two numbers. Loop uh, remainder is larger than smaller. If remainder is zero, then return okay smaller. Um, reset da 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 da. And this I know is correct. I don't need to test this. This is just a very simple function that will always give you the least common multiple between two numbers. So now we have two function, two utility functions that we can use. to calculate the least common multiple or the greatest common factor. And we just need to go back here to day 12. And we have all these counts, right? Um, so if we take the least common multiple of count zero, well, let's do it this way. Let's say let count x count y count z equals uh, I guess you can't destructure based on this. So let's just write it out verbosely. So let's say let answer two equals the least common multiple of counts zero dot unwrap and counts one dot unwrap. The reason why I can unwrap here is because we can never break from this loop unless all of these are sum, right? Um, and and the way least common multiples work, I should also mention this, is um, the least common multiple of A, B, and C is equal to the least common multiple of A and B um, and the least common multiple of that. Or, I mean, you can do any combination you want. So we can come here and say uh, least common multiple of the result of that and counts two and I am missing some of these. We need to un we need to we need to we need to put a question mark there, and we need to put a question mark. Oh, come on, go up. Nope, don't do that. Go up here. Go to the end of the line, and this needs to be a question mark as well. Oh, and we need um, to use create utils least common multiple. Oh, and uh, this we also need to unwrap. All right, so answer two, that should be answer two, and we should be done. And let's see if we get the right answer. So let's run both of them. We do indeed get this very large number, which should be the right answer. Um, so day 12, that looks like it's the right answer. Um, let's put it in our tests. So we should be getting that as the right answer to the problem. Uh, delete, 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 delete. All right, so now we can run, we can do run cargo test for all of them, and uh, day 12 should pass, and we should be done with day 12. Which takes a, still takes a long time to run, so what if we do run cargo test with release. Getting a phone call, so I'm gonna put it on. All right, I'm back, sorry about that. Had a phone call. Okay, so now our test passed. Test day 12 passes. Um, and it's fairly slow because we have to do all these loops to get the right answer. Um, but 
as you can see, the key to this problem was realizing that whatever happens in the x direction is independent of whatever happens in the y direction is independent of whatever happens in the z direction. And so we just need to know how long, uh, how long it takes to repeat until for each direction. And once we get that answer, then we can find the least common multiple of all those three values. And that is the answer to um, part two. Um, I feel like that was poorly explained, but hopefully our code uh, works. I mean, it's a little bit clunky. What's a little bit clunky about this is, well, one thing that's clunky is in the normal code, we're calculating the state of the moons for every direction. Even after we've already found the answer, like let's say we found the, well, what's the, let's say, I can't remember if you find the X for, if the X repeats first and then, the, or the Y or the Z, but let's say the X repeats first for whatever reason. It's the fastest to repeat, right? So we don't need to, after we hit that for X, we don't need to look at X anymore, but this state variable is like computing everything for X as well. Um, so we don't have to do that in the normal code. Um, but we kind of do have to do that in the SIMD code because the only way that we can get out values, um, the only way that we can look at these values as regular I64s um, in the SIMD version is to is to pull out all the X and Y and Z information all at once. Um, and so that's why that's written like that. Um, so you could further optimize it for the normal code, but I think this is, I think this is good. Uh, this is where I want to leave it, but. Um, hopefully that's clear. Um, and then I know I sort of hackishly did this from memory. I'm sure there's a better way to implement a least common multiple function. Well, the least common multiple function, this is the simplest way I know to get least common multiple, which is just take the two inputs, multiply them together and divide by the greatest common factor. The GCF function, this is Euclid's algorithm and I didn't really explain where it comes from. In fact, I don't really understand why this works that well, except for I know that uh, from memory, uh, this is how you implement Euclid's algorithm to get the greatest common factor, which is you break, you identify the larger or smaller number, and then in a loop, you calculate the remainder when you divide them. If the remain, remainder is ever zero, right, well, the smaller number is the greatest common factor. Um, but then, for reasons that I understand, you sort of set the larger to the smaller, you set the smaller to the remainder, and you rinse and repeat. And that's like a greatest common factor algorithm. So there you go, guys. That's day 12 all done. And we, we cleaned up the code from last time. Um, we also ran Cargo Clippy. I guess we should run Clippy again. So run Cargo Clippy. See if we introduced any new errors. And we did. We did. We did. This if, state, if statement can be collapsed. So let's collapse it. Um, what they're talking about here is these two statements, right? So we don't need that, and we don't need that. Oops. We do need this. This needs to be an and, and we don't need that. There we go. So this is equivalent code. This code will never run if this check fails, right? So that's how and expression works. So we don't need to worry about being piggy because the this will never be tr this will never even this will never execute, right? Unless this returns true. Um, and so this is basically equivalent code except for it's a little bit nicer and neater. So let's run cargo clippy again. We should have gotten rid of that warning, and indeed we did, and we're good on both sides. So let's um, let's run the test one more time, which we now probably need to do in release mode because day 12 takes a long time. Oops, cargo test dash dash release. And we'll get prepared to push to GitHub. So git status. Oh yeah, we made a lot of those changes for Cargo Clippy, right? So git diff. 
That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Maybe we should have done a separate commit for Cargo Clippy, but we'll just commit it all together. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yep. Yes. Alright, so git add all, git commit m uh, clippy and day 12 part 2. Git push. And there we go. So here in our repository. We should have day 12 should be um, complete. All right, with that, guys, I'm going to sign off. Uh, feel free, uh, as always, to leave comments um, and let me know how things are going. Hopefully, this is helpful for folks. I will be back and do day 13 as soon as I can. All right, talk to you soon. Bye.